Live from San Francisco, California, it's The Cube at VMworld 2014. Brought to you by VMware, Cisco, EMC, HP, and Nutanix. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Hey, welcome back everyone. We're here live in San Francisco, California for VMworld 2014. This is theCUBE. I'm John Furrier with my co-host Dave Vellante. Um, of course, extracting the signals from the noise. We talked to CEOs, social media directors, CEOs, Pat, Pat Gelsinger on. Of course, we want to get the VC angle because there's a huge startup opportunity. A lot of entrepreneurship going on around cloud, this convergence. It really is super exciting in the enterprise. Of course, the enterprise is hot, and, and of course, we're proud to have Frank Artali, managing uh, director at Ignition Partners, managing partner, managing director, general partner, basically the head honcho here uh, from Ignition World. Welcome back to theCUBE. CUBE alumni, welcome back. Great, glad to be here. Glad um, to be here. You're it's a seed investor, uh, personal investment in Cloudera. You also did the institutional, uh, some institutional ground early, early stage. Great success. We've known you from Hadoop World. You're out here kicking the tires, scouring for deals in cloud because there's certainly a big data angle, there's a lot of enterprise action. So give us a quick update on the fund. You're burning that cash, you're still writing checks, and how much is left, and what are you looking at? Yeah, yeah, okay, that's great, John. <laughs> really appreciate it. And, and uh, also, like, great to be back. Uh, great to be a CUBE alumni, always, uh, always fabulous. Uh, it's one of the best, uh, best parts of VMworld for me, one of the meetings I really look forward to. So again, thanks, thanks much. Thank you. And uh, you know, it was like a few years ago, you know, we called uh, we call the play on big data. And I remember actually sitting here with the, uh, in the cube, you know, talking about it. And at Hadoop World. Yeah, at Hadoop World, yeah. yeah. And you know, people were looking at, us, looking at us a lot back then, saying, wow, well, what, is, you know, what does this mean? And it really was the, the beginning of a resurgence uh, in, in enterprise IT that we see continuing today. And when I'm walking around the, the show floor today, it is just amazing how much real innovation that we do see, we do see going on. Uh, as John, as you said, so we well, we closed our fund uh, about a year and a half ago, and we've been we've been actively uh, actively investing. One of our most recent investments uh, is in a local company on the Bay Area in San Francisco called Trifacta. Again, so uh, if you recall, when we we talked about things in big data. You said what would be next? I said it'll be applications that only exist because of things like Hadoop, and you know, Trifacta is a, a prime example of that. As people start living in data, you know, tools like that will be become really important. We'll see Trifacta, by the way, at Tableau Conference in Seattle. Oh, yeah, we'll Tableau Conference in two live. weeks. We'll be there. We'll be there. Uh, you're going to yeah. be there? I will be in Seattle that week, so. Okay, yeah. so make sure you come by the Stop queue. By the yeah, queue. That's great. No, we'll and do. they have some leadership change. I noticed they have new new CMO over there um, and team. And how much did you guys put into Trifecta? So we were we we led the last round. Uh, we don't talk about the we don't talk about exact <laughs> exact dollars that we do put in. Uh, yeah, new CEO Adam Wilson uh, just joined uh, just joined Trifecta, uh, and he's hit the ground running. Been on board about a month. Uh, again, doing some, doing some great work there. That's Joe Hellerstein's company, right? Yeah, Joe Hellerstein and Jeffrey here. So uh, Jeffrey, of course, is uh, University of Washington and Joe at, uh, uh, at, uh, at Berkeley. Joe, another CUBE alum. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Early days, he came yeah. on. And no, he was at uh, Big Data SV. We were down, he was awesome, he's great. And he, he, had, he was the only, I think he took it off his profile, but the management team had their GitHub profile, which I was like, that is so That's baller. strong, that that's is, strong. That is strong, that's come strong. on, that's. Badass, as yeah. they say. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's really strong. <laughs> but you know, um, you know, John, one of the things that uh, you know, we always like to look at trends. And you ask me, like, what are we, what are we investing in? And and we make long-term bets as early-stage investors. You know, we, we're not investing in things that we expect to to see cash from you know, next next year. And uh, and many of the trends are things that are, that are repeating themselves. And uh, a trend that we see right now and are very encouraged by is that every business is becoming a software company, businesses of all sizes. And that doesn't mean you're an independent software vendor selling software for a living, but whether you're a, a financial institution or a pharmaceutical company or retail operation uh, or forestry company, everyone is hiring, hiring software developers. And, and so what we'll see happening over the course of the next few years is the kind of tools that professional developers use, again, people that sell software for a living, kind of make their way, or at least the techniques that they use will make their way uh, into, into enterprise. And so, and so those are great, great opportunities. And if you look at a, a classic business today that's deploying internal applications, they're still very traditional, Windows stylized, uh, front end applications. Of course, I worked at Microsoft from 1991 to, to 2000, where that's, that's sort of that first set of tooling for enterprise developers really came along. And now we see a set of challenges that enterprise developers have that were conquered first by the professional ISVs, in particular enterprise mobile. And so we're just really encouraged about as we see more and more tool sets for enterprise developers 
to really enable mobile applications, and I think that's, that's one exciting area. Well, Frank, I'll, I'll get a little stroke here for you because that, you won't say it yourself, but you were really, really instrumental in Windows NT, which is really the beginning of the client server, the PC client server, Wintel server market, which really exploded the developer community. It kind of gave the headroom. Something we're seeing in, with Node, with JavaScript, you're seeing that same thing in the cloud. So, you know, you, you have been there. So I got to ask you this developer question. You know, I, I tweeted, you know, to quote Balmer, developer, developer, developers, to apps, apps, apps. The theme here at VMworld categorically is apps are dictating terms to the infrastructure. Programmable infrastructure, infrastructure as code. That, that rolls up big data, that also rolls up systems, operating systems, if you will, NT-like. So, if the thesis is more developers in-house, is what you're saying, yeah. that means huge onboarding of developers in the business. Now, this is not a core competency for businesses in the, in the past. And you really go back to the mainframe, Dave and I were commenting that that's when you saw the last real in-house population of write, people writing code for differentiation for the company it was to a source of differentiation. And, and so, and so what's your yeah. take on that? How is that going to happen? What, how, what's going to accelerate that trend? What tooling needs to be there? What's your take? Right, so, so as you said, the uh, you know, enterprises typically are not the best uh, organizations that are building software development teams. And so, what you'll see is uh, a trend towards adoption of tools that got started with the, with the professional ISV community. Uh, and also uh, a level of hiring that hasn't occurred before. So most of the really forward-looking enterprises uh, are taking a point of view where they have to start by being present where real software development occurs. And so if you drive up and down Silicon Valley today or in the Gowanus area in New York City or in the Seattle area, you see businesses that aren't software companies putting offices in those areas. So if you go into, uh, in, into the valley here, you'll see that, that Merck uh, and Johnson & Johnson, as an example of pharmaceutical companies, actually have innovation offices uh, in, the, uh, in the area to start really engaging uh, the early stage venture community and early stage software GE, community. You know, GE huge has huge investment. innovation. I mean, right. yeah, GE, GE's been at it you know, for, I mean, GE's always been a software company. Right. I mean, they have, you know, forever they've had soft, software sure. R&D, but, you know, but they're doing more and more. Uh, but the challenges you know, are now to bring the kind of things like, like Node, as, as you brought up. We have an investment in a company called Strongloop that is commercializing that and making it much more accessible uh, for, uh, for uh, enterprise developers of, of every kind. And so you know, the thing that I always encourage you know, companies that are enterprise, uh, enterprise developers, don't look at the entire smorgasbord, really look at, look at things that you know can make work make a bet on those things that you, can know, you know can make work, and then build your teams around that, because you really can't explore everything and do, a lot of the fa and do all of the fail fast, throw things away, that a lot can of the give professionals an example can. On that? can. Give an example, give a concrete example of that. So I'll just use, I'll use some past examples and, and fast yeah. forward that. And so, you know, so like back in the 90s when we first started seeing client server development, something that I was, again, very, very familiar with because I was, I was part of it, there were so many ways to do that development. And so then we just encouraged people to, to, to begin with a set of, say, communication protocols at the bottom. And once you do that, then, then set standards for how you use those communications protocols internally, then set a set of standards on how you do, as an example, your user interface design and your database design. You know, and likewise, today, as we move forward, we say, well, there are lots of ways to do things like, uh, lots of ways to do things like enterprise mobile development. Well, so for the enterprise guys, we say, start with what you know. Well, you probably know .NET and Java. So you don't want to go steer all of your people to some set of languages and technologies that they really are unfamiliar with. And then so start from the top there, in this case, and work your way down. So you say, okay, I know how to use .NET and Java for my enterprise development, now how do I go mobilize that? So just a, just a, just a very, so a very really concrete a road map for develop, for the, on the development cycle side. So there's a shift in software development life cycle, you're saying? Correct, correct. A absolute shift in, in development life cycle. But again, the, since the, the enterprise developer you, the enterprises are not places that will just, you can't jettison people and hire completely new ones. You have to take the teams that you have and kind of bring them forward into the future. Okay, so you brought up GE and, I'll, and you brought up some of the software side. Right now, the quote we heard on theCUBE last week when we were in Boston, two weeks ago when we were in Boston was, it's all about the user interface, right? Because if it's an app specific, the user interface is everything. Even GE's bolting on some really cool DevOps, but tailoring the UI for machines, hospitals. So the apps are dictating essentially, again, back to the workloads, right? Yeah. So what's your take on this? And what's your advice to entrepreneurs when they're saying, you know, how do I design my app? And do I have, is, it, is, it, is it driven by the interface and the functional description? And uh, what's your take on that? Right, so uh, you know, design, is, design is, is coming front and center. You know, again, it's not enough just to be able to provide access to the data that, that the end user needs, but it has to be done in such a way 
where the end user likes your application. And I know that's you know, kind of an ephemeral term. Well, what does it mean to have an end user like my application? But it does need to provide utility and it has to be, it has to be engaging. Uh, in these days now, especially with mobile, the form factor is so constrained that you really need to be careful in terms of, in terms of what you do. Uh, in the old days when you had, or even currently, when you have a big screen, the tendency is to just put everything in front of the user all at once. And so what we see are applications that are really well designed in terms of bringing the user to what they need exactly at that point in time and not having them waste time. Those are the things that they, that they really like. But for the first time, I think you'll actually see within enterprises of all sizes, you'll see people who are really focused on product design. And when, uh, back in the 90s, uh, when we were building our first tooling for enterprise developers with client server, I don't think I, I met anybody that worked uh, at an enterprise you know, IT development shop who had the title of product designer. And we, we're starting to see more of that now. And that's a great thing. So Frank, we asked uh, Jerry Chen and, and, uh, and Pete Sansini, I would love to get your, your thoughts on this earlier this week. Um, what should we make of the trend toward companies you know, doing larger raises, maybe not going public? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? What are the pros and cons? What's your take on that? Yeah, well so in, in terms of raising large rounds, not going public and building more value before you, before you do that, you know, it's, it's really, a matter of, really a matter of taste and what the company needs to, to do in order to continue to operate independently. So whether you raise a large private round or you go public, it's all about continuing to operate as an independent entity uh, and not, going through, not becoming part of another company. And there's, there's a subtext to this, especially for enterprise, for enterprise software. So when you go talk to, uh, let's say, a modern CIO or a modern VP of infrastructure or, or uh, VP of software at an enterprise customer, one of the first questions they'll ask the, the startup or the small company is, how will you stay independent? And how will you not just become a feature of something that I already own and something that's not innovating? And so whatever you do in terms of raising large rounds, and valuations are, are just a side effect of that, or, or going public, it is about, ma about maintaining independence and being able to innovate for your customers. And also, you know, the comment that uh, Chen made was, going public is also a lot of pressure. So if you're not ready, and you know, we weave in the extra dimension of global uh, aspect with cloud consumption being right. a global phenomenon, you know, even Cloudera, you know, is getting there, they're moving as fast as they can to be global, but that may be a problem to go public too early if, you're not, if your build out's not done. So how, do you agree with that? Yeah, so in terms of, in terms of when, is, when is the right time to go public, um, it's, I, I'm not sure there's really a, a, great, uh, a great, let's say unified answer for that, but let's, let's talk about what going public means. It really means operating as a public entity. And so, you know, a lot of people think, well, going public means just you go, you know, go cash in your stock and you, know, you have an ATM that's flowing, but there's an awful lot of things that you know, you're required to Most do. Those days are gone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to that, that's now the private round before you go public. <laughs> yeah. 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 To operate publicly. And what we try to do is we encourage our, we encourage our companies that are really planning you know, to operate publicly is to think about that at least two years, two years in advance. And so, yes, going global is part of it, but there's also elements of, of governance uh, and controls uh, inside, and also around predictability of revenue that are super important, again, to be an operating public entity. And you can see how companies that, that do have predictable performance are rewarded, and companies that don't uh, are, you know, are punished. And so, people say, well, it's all about growth. Well, it's not, it's not all about growth. But the global aspect, of course, is important. If you look at the overall market, again, where I specialize in enterprise IT, you know, I just know this from my, my Windows days, things haven't changed that much in that, you're looking at, at, at anywhere from, from 28 to 35% uh, of, of system software is, is US. So you really have to think outside the US yeah. if you're going to start. But your premise was yeah, that yeah. The, the, the enterprise buyer wants the, the company to stay independent and so makes themselves acquisition proof essentially, yeah. right? So help, help me understand that. I mean, why wouldn't, for example, a Microsoft co customer want to say, okay, hey, why don't you just consume Hortonworks, make my right. life easier? So there's, um, there's a couple of schools of thought uh, around, around M&A. So, if, if, your, if your product actually would, um, if you have a product that your customers believe would benefit from being integrated into, a, into another product, then there'll, there'll be that pull on the M&A side because largely the customers will tell the big buyers, Do it. hey, you should buy yeah. these guys and put, them in my, and put them in this thing that I already own because these two things always have to work together. Mm -hmm. And so, in, in fact, when I, was at, uh, you know, when, I, when I was at Microsoft, customers used to come tell us things you know, like, that, like that all the time. And we weren't we weren't a big but we weren't a buyer of you know, large enterprise technology you know, at the time, uh, but it was it was a message that we did here. Now, in terms of again being you know being independent, the reason is you know, to 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 prove that you can be independent. Customers are smart. They'll say, "Whoa, how much money do you guys have in the bank?" 
and if you, they know if you don't if you don't have a lot of money enough money in the bank to at least you know take yourself for you know for a year and bring on people to put in front of them to help understand the product, help do deployment, then they don't feel like you'd have skin in the game. So again, it's, it's two schools there. Some of the customers believe that you need to be independent in order to continue to innovate, but at, then at other times, the integration outweighs that sort in, of that in innovation your experience, factor. Were, in your experience, were customers good indicators of, of good acquisitions, or were they mixed? <laughs> yeah, I, I would say like, so I would say your customers, are, the customers. Yeah, your customers are good indicators of almost, of almost anything, right? So, uh, well, uh, like, quote. yeah, they really are. Customers, you almost say the customer's always right. So people ask me, how do you, you know, when I, when I was, yeah, when I was worked in, uh, in customer facing roles, how did you hire new salespeople, sure. as an example? And so I'll ask my customer who their best salesperson is that's at a competitor, and I'll go hire that person. So, you know, in, in a sense, your customer's a great, uh, you know, a, a great sounding board and a great filter. Now, what you just want to be careful about not having a sample size of one. <laughs> yeah. right? well, so I think that's the thing that's coming out of the cloud market is this customer centric. If you look at the, all these incubators and all the, the programmer kind of trend that's going on now, one of the things that people are saying is be customer centric. That's the ethos in the enterprise. Certainly uh, a best practice. But uh, you know, I got to ask you the real question on the table that everyone else answered, Herod, Sincini, and Chen. Okay. Um, uh, everyone they answered it too. Everyone yeah. loves algorithms, right? So yeah. what's your algorithm for deals? What's your investment thesis for the VMware community in cloud? Um, Herod has a, a specific thesis that he believes yeah. is the preferred future. What's your thesis for investing right now? Right, so I think a, a more of a macro view uh, on investment thesis. First of all, and perhaps the most important thing, when you're investing in software for businesses, you have to be able to answer the question to yourself, is this a thing, is this a class of thing that every business will need one of? And then you say, is this team that I'm speaking to about this thing, is this the team to create that category, define it, and be the first mover, and build it into a, and build a category, build a business? And so for me, those, those really are the core of my investment thesis. Which is essentially big market and great team. Big market, is, is great team. Is there any technical thing you're looking at? So, uh, yeah, so right now, I, mean, I, love, you know, I love changes in computing trend. Uh, I do, anytime there's a change, there's, there's opportunity around that. Uh, so I love I love the, I love the addition from big from big of big data to relational. I love when virtualization. I was at ZenSource. You know, I love when virtualization happened that created opportunity. You know I think the uh, I think the movement around uh, around containers in terms of what it brings in terms of a of a style of computing uh, will will create uh, continued opportunity. But I think we're also still early days on the big data side. I mean the you know the early days here is still on the developer side. You know central IT needs to come in, manage it, control it, make it better, optimize it, secure it. I'm more applications around that, and so I love changes in compute, and I, and I love data. Right, so, so to be specific, I'll ask you, what is, in your opinion, the biggest enabler, technology enabler, for this next transformation inflection point? So, I mean, so, so right now, really, what, you know, what we're seeing is, there are changes in, uh, believe it or not, I think silicon technology is still the, is still the enabler, and we just see such uh, increase in transistors, uh, lowering price of memory, uh, increase in speed of, of I.O. that really allow us to do things in software that just couldn't be done. And so I always go back to the hardware in places that I'll, I'll place bets there. Yeah, and Dave and I were talking about the Linux kernel and Flash opens up a lot of doors. So, so basically what you're saying is a ton of work still to be done. It never yeah, ends. A lot of deals to do. Never, never ends. <laughs> Frank Artelli, managing partner at Ignition Partners, great firm, um, certainly they know their, their stuff, they've been through many waves of innovation. Thanks for coming on theCUBE, great to chat with you. Thanks for taking the, your time out of your busy schedule, and then we'll let you go hunt some more deals out there. This is theCUBE, live from San Francisco, VMworld 2012. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. All right, great guys.